Fort Ticonderoga, formerly Fort Carillon, is a large 18th-century star fort built by the French at Anarrows near the south end of Lake Champlain in northern New York in the United States. It was constructed by Canadian-born French military engineer Michel Chartier de Lobinière, Marquis de Lobinière between October 1755 and 1757 during the Seven Years' War, often referred to as the French and Indian War in the U.S. It was of strategic importance during the 18th-century colonial conflicts between Great Britain and France, and again played an important role during the American Revolutionary War. The site controlled a river portage alongside the mouth of the rapids infested La Chute River in the 3.5 miles between Lake Champlain and Lake Georgian was strategically placed in conflicts over trade routes between the British-controlled Hudson River Valley and the French-controlled St. Lawrence River Valley. The terrain amplified the importance of the site. Both lakes were long and narrow, oriented north-south, as were the many ridge lines of the Appalachian Mountains extending as far south as Georgia, creating the near-impassable mountainous terrains to the east and west of the Great Appalachian Valley that the site commanded. The name Ticonderoga comes from the Iroquois word Tecontero, Ken, meaning, it is at the junction of two waterways. During the 1758 Battle of Carillon, 4,000 French defenders were able to repel an attack by 16,000 British troops near the fort. In 1759, the British returned and drove a token French garrison from the fort. During the American Revolutionary War, the fort again saw action in May 1775 when the Green Mountain Boys and other state militia under the command of Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, captured it from the British in a surprise attack. Cannons captured were transported to Boston where their deployment forced the British to abandon the city in March 1776. The Americans held the fort until June 1777, when British forces under General John Burgoyne occupied high ground above it and threatened the Continental Army troops, leading them to withdraw from the fort and its surrounding defences. The only direct attack on the fort took place in September 1777, when John Brown led 500 Americans in an unsuccessful attempt to capture the fort from about 100 British defenders. The British abandoned the fort after the failure of the Saratoga campaign, and it ceased to be of military value after 1781. It fell into ruin, leading people to strip it of some of its usable stone, metal, and woodwork. It became a stop on tourist routes of the area in the 19th century. Its private owners restored the fort early in the 20th century. A foundation now operates the fort as a tourist attraction, museum, and research center. Geography and Early History Lake Champlain, which forms part of the border between New York and Vermont, and the Hudson River together formed an important travel route that was used by Indians before the arrival of European colonists. The route was relatively free of obstacles to navigation, with only a few portages. One strategically important place on the route lies at a narrows near the southern end of Lake Champlain, where Ticonderoga Creek, known in colonial times as the La Chute River, enters the lake carrying water from Lake George. Although the site provides commanding views of the southern extent of Lake Champlain, Mount Defiance, at 853 feet, and two other hills overlook the area. Indians had occupied the area for centuries before French explorer Samuel de Champlain first arrived there in 1609. Champlain recounted that the Algonquins, with whom he was traveling, battled a group of Iroquois nearby. In 1642, French missionary Isaac Jogues was the first white man to traverse the portage at Ticonderoga while escaping a battle between the Iroquois and members of the Huron tribe. The French, who had colonized the St. Lawrence River Valley to the north, and the English, who had taken over the Dutch settlements that became the province of New York to the south began contesting the area as early as 1691, when Peter Schuyler built his small wooden fort at the Ticonderoga point on the western shore of the lake. 
These colonial conflicts reached their height in the French and Indian War, which began in 1754. Construction. In 1755, following the Battle of Lake George, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, the governor of the French province of Canada, sent his cousin Michel Chartier de Lobinier to design and construct a fortification at this militarily important site which the French called Fort Carillon. The name Carillon has variously been attributed to the name of a former French officer, Philippe de Carrion du Fresnoy, who established a trading post at the site in the late 17th century, or to the sounds made by the La Chute River, which were said to resemble the chiming bells of O'Carillon. Construction on the star-shaped fort, which Lobinier based on designs of the renowned French military engineer Vauban, began in October 1755 and then proceeded slowly during the warmer weather months of 1756 and 1757, using troops stationed at nearby Fort St. Frederic and from Canada. The work in 1755 consisted primarily of beginning construction on the main walls and on the Lobinier Redoubt, an outwork to the west of the site that provided additional coverage of the La Chute River. The next year saw the building of the four main bastions and a sawmill on the La Chute. Works load in 1757, when many of the troops prepared for and participated in the attack on Fort William Henry. The barracks and demi-loons were not completed until spring 1758. Walls and bastions The French built the fort to control the south end of Lake Champlain and prevent the British from gaining military access to the lake. Consequently, its most important defences, the Rain and Germain bastions, were directed to the northeast and northwest, away from the lake, with two demi-loons further extending the works on the land side. The Johannes and Longdock bastions overlooked the lake to the south, providing cover for the landing area outside the fort. The walls were 7 feet high and 14 feet thick, and the whole works was surrounded by a glacier and a dry moat 5 feet deep and 15 feet wide. When the walls were first erected in 1756, they were made of squared wooden timbers, with earth filling the gap. The French then began to dress the walls with stone from a quarry about one mile away, although this work was never fully completed. When the main defences became ready for use, the fort was armed with cannons hauled from Montreal and Fort St. Frederic. Inside and outside the fort contained three barracks and four storehouses. One bastion held a bakery capable of producing 60 loaves of bread a day. A powder magazine was hacked out of the bedrock beneath the Joannes Bastion. All the construction within the fort was of stone. A wooden palisade protected an area outside the fort between the southern wall and the lake shore. This area contained the main landing for the fort and additional storage facilities and other works necessary for maintenance of the fort. When it became apparent in 1756 that the fort was too far to the west of the lake, the French constructed an additional redoubt to the east to enable cannon to cover the lake's narrows. Officers' barracks, right, soldiers' barracks, left. Inside the first wall, officers' barracks at left, soldiers' barracks at right. Store room and powder magazine, soldiers' barracks at right. Front of the fort. View of the lake from the front. Back view of the fort. Analysis. By 1758 the fort was largely complete. The only ongoing work thereafter consisted of dressing the walls with stone. Still, General Montcalm and two of his military engineers surveyed the works in 1758 and found something to criticize in almost every aspect of the forts. Construction, the buildings were too tall and thus easier for attackers' cannon fire to hit. The powder magazine leaked, and the masonry was of poor quality. The critics apparently failed to notice the fort's significant strategic weakness. Several nearby hills commanded the fort. Lobinier, who may have won the job of building the fort only because he was related to Governor Vaudreuil, had lost a bid to become Canada's chief engineer to Nicolas Sarabors de Pontleroy, one of the two surveying engineers, in 1756, all of which may explain the highly negative report. Lobinier's career suffered for years afterwards. 
William Nestor, in his exhaustive analysis of the Battle of Carillon, notes additional problems with the fort's construction. The fort was small for a Vauban-style fort, about 500 feet wide, with a barracks capable of holding only 400 soldiers. Storage space inside the fort was similarly limited, requiring the storage of provisions outside the fort's walls in exposed places. Its cistern was small, and the water quality was supposedly poor.